Let me start with a question. Does anybody here knows anyone who suffers or has suffered from depression or burnout? Wow. Does anyone know someone with Parkinson or anxiety disorders? It's fair to say that the majority of you will have to deal with some of these diseases during your lifetime. Now imagine a time when people suffering from these diseases are put in an MRI machine and after a few real-time brain scans feel substantially better, often even better than with psychological treatment or pills. Today I'm going to tell you that this time has arrived, thanks to real-time functional brain imaging. With this technique, we can literally observe the ongoing brain activity while a person is scanned. And since all this activity is available, we do not show it only to the researcher, but we show also some of that information back to the patient in the scanner. Live. This is called neurofeedback. In a few minutes, I will describe to you in detail how it works, and I will show you how we use this novel technique to treat patients. So how did I become a leading expert of real-time brain imaging? Ever since high school, I had two passions. Firstly, I was always mesmerized by computer programming. I still do this today for time reasons, mostly in the nights and in the weekends. My second passion was the brain, how it works, how it creates our mind. My favorite read with the age of 16 was the book Denken, Lernen, Vergessen. And that drove my peers crazy because I talked all the time about neurons and how they connect. At some point, some of my peers even called me Zweistein. You know, Einstein was already given. <laughs> <laughs> so did I had this noble intention when I started 15 years ago to program this real-time software? Not at all. I did not want to heal patients. Honestly speaking, science is always and often at least driven also by fun. Does anyone here know the classic game Pong? Good. You see here, I developed a software called Brain Pong, where my PhD students could use their brain to play this game together. So when I talked this to them, this idea, many um, were excited about it, but some also said, now our professor has gone really crazy. You know? So in my version of the Pong game, Brain Pong, the players do not get the joysticks, like you see here, but they have to learn to play this game purely on changing their own brain activity by doing something in their mind. And you see here now how two players play that game and you will see that the two players, so one is in one scanner, the other is another scanner, so we scan two at the same time, and they kick the ball back and forth and now you will see that the green player on, on the left side gets the racket up on the screen and now you have to understand that he gets it up by, at that time, increasing the brain activity in a certain part of his brain. So he does it without moving the body. While I'm not fully realized at that time how uh, this punk brain game was really important because it, it because it paved the way both for our clinical neurofeedback therapy and also for a computer interface for login patients that I describe later. So, the point is, how does this real-time functional brain imaging work? Because we want often to extract data from tiny regions in the brain, like the amygdala, we need a technique which has a high spatial resolution. And at the moment, this is only possible with the technique called MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So we want to extract data from tiny regions, and it's still a miracle, even for me, that we can observe what's going on in the brain without having to open the head of a person. So if you now think that fMRI measures the activity in the 100 billion neurons 
in your brains, I have to disappoint you. What MRI measures is more related to what neurons eat, and this is oxygen and glucose. So if I'm now talking to you, the neurons in my language areas are very active because they work very hard right now. And the blood vessels surrounding my language areas respond to this begging for food of the neurons, and they respond to that by increasing the flow of fresh blood to these regions. In this fresh blood is oxygen, and the oxygen changes the magnetic fields in these regions. And that is what is picked up by MRI machines, by magnetic resonance imaging. But to make out of these oxygen-related activity data real images of brain activity requires a lot of number crunching. It takes a long time. And some of our contribution was to develop software which can analyze all these brain data super fast. And then we can, in principle, create complete 3D movies in real time of the ongoing brain activity. But we do not show the whole brain activity back to a person in the scanner. Here you see the activity of a scanned person from different tasks, and we select only one region, shown here in yellow, to the subject. And we want to show it to the subject not as a movie of a brain, but with a nice representation. So we show the amount of activity in a thermometer. The more activity is in the brain area, the higher this thermometer will show the activity. Now there's not much activity, so it's empty, but now the subject increases the activity and he will see this in the thermometer, it goes up. Since the subject gets this picture in the scanner, he can learn to do something in his mind to change the amount of activity. And after some time, he finds out that he can indeed modulate himself, the own brain activity. And this is the essence of neurofeedback training. So can we now use this technique to help people to activate areas which make them happy? Can we use it even for depressed patients? Can we also help lock in patients who cannot communicate to get them a voice back? I'm going to show you now three cases where we tried to answer these questions. In the first case, we thought, why not asking experts in meditation? They should have a trained mind to activate brain areas. And we were very fortunate that we could work with Mathieu Ricard, who is a famous meditator. He's a Buddhist monk residing in a monastery in, in Nepal. He's famous for many things. Probably some of you know him. He wrote a book about happiness. He is close to the Dalai Lama. And he even makes beautiful photographs of the Himalayas. But most important for us is the case that he was called the most happy person on the planet by popular media. So we put him in the MRI machine and observed what's going on if he meditates. And we were really impressed. He meditates in real time, so he saw himself what's going on in the brain. He was a scientist himself. And then he saw this error goes up and that error goes up, mostly related to emotional processing. We were most excited that he activate one area called the ventral striatum, which is usually only active if we experience deep pleasure and reward. So that shows that he can indeed deeply move himself into a positive, satisfying mood. So we should all meditate. So inspired by these findings, we thought, why not trying this out and maybe we can use it to help depressed people? You know, depression, is the most common psychiatric disease. It's a severe mood disorder. About 10% of the population in each country suffers from major depression. It's more frequent in women than men, but we don't know why, honestly speaking. So, we only use depressed patients which were already treated with medicaments and psychological therapy, but did not get further improvement. So we, we took really the, the heart patients, which did not get otherwise help. So we put them in the scanner and we asked them, please, you get now feedback from parts of your brain. So it was the emotional areas, which I show you here, which is known from neuroscience. You see the limbic system 
is actually what we used to give them feedback. The limbic system is our emotional structure in the brain. It consists of many areas. Most important ones are cingulate cortex, hippocampus, and amygdala. So we gave them feedback from these regions and asked them, try to activate the thermometer at some moments in time and to deactivate at others. And we were surprised that only after two, three practices, they could activate these areas. So we asked them, how do you do that? And they said, we learned more and more to use, for example, emotional memories to go in and out of emotional states at will. And this thing goes up and down, what you show me there. So they learned to treat themselves to some extent, to get the feeling back of control over themselves, which they had lost as a patient. But the real question is, did it also help them? Did it help them in daily life? Outside the scanner, so were they less depressed? The, the figure here shows you that this was indeed the case. You see here, for each patient, two bars next to each other. The orange bar shows the depression score, so how depressed they were, before our treatment, and the green bars after our treatment. And you can see that indeed, the depression scores go substantially down in five out of eight patients. And this on top and beyond what has been done with them before. Based on these astonishing results, there is now a much bigger study just now in progress. And if this study is also successful, this new therapy form might become a standard clinical application. In my final example, I want to show you locked-in patients, how we could help them. Does anyone know what locked-in means? If you are locked in, you can no longer move the muscles of your body. It is a severe disease. It normally happens because of a stroke in the midbrain or because of ALS, a disease you might have heard in the recent big ice bucket challenge. That is this disease. So, can we help these people? The point is, I show you now, this picture here is from, from Katya. Katya is actually 23 years old right now. Up to year 21, Katya was a fully normal girl. She had friends, she went to school, she enjoyed life. But in only two years, she became completely locked in. In her case, it was a rare genetic disease. So Katya can now no longer stand up and walk. Katya can not, not even breathe by herself. She has to get ventilated to survive. And worst of all, she can't speak. Can you imagine living in such a restricted life? The mind of Katya is literally a prisoner of her own body. So we tried to help these people. And since we, when we use our real-time brain scanning technique, we literally see the mind working in the brain. So could we not just, if she thinks a word, just read this out from the brain activity, and then she could communicate, we show her thoughts. Unfortunately, the technique which is currently available cannot do that. So can we not help her? The scientist does not stop here. So what we did is, because she understands what you are saying, she's fully conscious, she's just imprisoned in the body. So she understands what you say. So we agreed with her on a communication code. For example, we told her, if you get a question and want to say yes, then you basically do some mental task, something in your mind. For example, you recite a poem which you know for a few seconds. So what happens now? If in our real-time system, we see the brain activity, and when the language areas for reciting a poem become now strongly active, we know, ha, she wants to say yes. And if we do not see them active, or another region from another task, she wants to say no. So we have a basic means of communication. We extended that, showing you this here, and we scanned these people by showing them, letting them do three different tasks. So this is a person in the scanner drawing in the mind pictures, just in the mind, not moving the body. 
Now the same person is navigating through the house, running through the floor, going to the living room, and all this just in the mind. And the blue regions here show the activity for this mental task. And finally, this is reciting poem. We call it inner speech. The subject now recites a poem. You see all the left-sided language errors lighting up. The important point here is that all these three different mental things activate different regions in the brain, like you see here. So now we can see from these regions what task she's doing. And if we agree on a communication code, we can do some things for her depending on what brain activity she performs. We could, for example, assign each of these to one letter of the alphabet. But then we would have only three letters, right? We could, she could just say words with, say, ABC. It would be terrible. So therefore, what we did, we extended that and no longer look only what, where it becomes active, but we also look when she's doing it and how long she's doing it. And we agreed with a very ingenious technique to a code which is easy to learn, just a minute, so that she can now really use this technique to communicate all 27 letters of the alphabet. So she can now freely say what she wants. She has not just to answer the questions of a researcher or her parents. And it belongs to the greatest moments of a scientist to see that patients like Katya can get back a voice with this real-time brain imaging technique. In conclusion, <laughs> you have seen that our technique has already changed the life of many patients. But this is just the beginning. We get funding at the moment from the European Union, and we are grateful for that, because we can bring this to more hospitals over the next years. We can find out with this research how best to help people. And we can also see whether we can help people with other diseases like addiction and autism. But why does this work so well? I think this technique empowers patients and even healthy people to control their thoughts and emotions in a specific way with a precise feedback from the related regions of the brain related to the disease. And to control our thoughts and emotions to improve in some way, to get better and better controlled, is not only good for patients, it is important for all mankind. Thank you.